Sorry, my phone. I don't know if you can hear me. You can yes, start. I can hear. Can I start? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, bonjour from America. I'm sorry I couldn't attend in person. I just had uh, back surgery, so I'm I'm still unable to walk properly. Um, the, thank you for coming. The subject of this presentation is my new book, uh, Tobias on Locks and Insecurity Engineering. I'm going to go through a number of slides um, about the topic, why it's important, and then there are several videos of showing the problem with defective designs and locks and access control systems, which actually affect all of you in, in many ways because physical security protects your cybersecurity. So we'll go through the slides. I hope you can hear me okay. So in security engineering, the definition and the problem. The problem, in security engineering by lock manufacturers, locks, physical security, and access control systems are often not secure, even though they meet all of the standards. In security engineering <clears throat> highlights the need to forecast, discover, and prevent insecure designs from reaching the end user. Why is it important? Locks and access control systems protect infrastructure. High security locks may appear secure, but may be subject to compromise. Standards do not guarantee security, which is really important because in Europe especially, um, you're governed by the standards, the CEN standards, and we have been able to defeat many high security locks, notwithstanding they are protected by and rated by the standards. And in the book, I, I went through how to assess the security of locks. My background, I'm a lawyer, assistant attorney general in you know, one of our states, of the organized, chief of the organized crime unit, prosecutor, and investigator. I've lectured all over the world in security. I've written eight books. I have 32 patents. Most importantly, I, our team works for the largest lock manufacturers in the United States, Europe, and the Middle East to develop exploits in their locks. In other words, <clears throat> we're hired to figure out how to open their locks when they can't be opened. In security engineering, what is it? What is it? And what does it involve? Why does it occur? Is anything new? Is it anything new? Who does it affect? What is the result? Why is it important? And there are examples of the problem in this lecture. So my book, which is about 700 pages, just came out, Wiley Publishing, goes into great detail about all of the requirements to ensure that you don't have insecurity engineering. <clears throat> what was the book, who was the book written for? Cybersecurity experts, design engineers, risk managers and legal counsel, crime labs, criminal investigators, intelligence agencies and covert entry teams. So the book is very, very detailed. There's many, there's seven parts of the book. They encompass legal, patents, engineering, design, and the history of locks and how they could be defeated even 200 years ago, which is really relevant. The problem today is that design engineers don't have the history and there's no institutional memory in the lock industry because everybody's retiring or being laid off. So there's two books that define the problem and issues. One of the books was written by Ross Anderson at Cambridge University, where I used to lecture for him. It is the best book in the industry for cybersecurity. Again, it's called Security Engineering. It's in its third edition. Sadly, Ross passed away in April, um, but the book will continue. It is the primary reference in the industry. My book, Tobias Unlocks and in Insecurity Engineering, really came from Ross's book. Um, as I lectured at Cambridge over the past 20 years, I decided the real problem and the real identification of the problem, especially in our field, is insecurity engineering. Ross fully agreed, supported the book, 
And actually, Wiley is now selling my book and his book as a companion. So in the lock industry, there are complex issues involved in locks design, engineering, legal, technical, and security. Why I wrote the book. It's based on my experience really from the last 25 years to identify and minimize design vulnerabilities in locks and security hardware. Design defects can be critical for liability and security. Um, based on my experience working with all the different companies, most of the engineers uh, really don't understand bypass technologies, they, they don't understand the history of locks, and they don't know the current technology in bypassing locks. So I wanted to provide a roadmap to analyze locks and access control systems for security vulnerabilities and how they can be exploited. That is throughout the book, really the emphasis. How the book can help you. You can understand how different locks could have been compromised, provide ideas about target locks and a way to assess whether they are secure against attack. That's probably the most important. Ideas on reverse engineering security for covert entry teams and facility protection. And what are the different tools and techniques available to defeat locks? Many of these are in the book. The problem, how to avoid design defects. Understanding the history of lock design and why they could be compromised. I went back several hundred years in the primary classification of locks and showed how they were defeated a couple hundred years ago, which believe it or not is still relevant today. In the book is development of techniques to bypass different mechanisms then and now. Choose the right design team and red team to vet designs. I really went into that in detail so that the people that are ass assessing the security of locks don't believe everything they're told. And a summary of bypass tools then and now. There's a lot of things that design engineers and security experts must understand for attack, attack techniques by some of the best craftsmen. A historical techniques developed by Hobbs, Brahma, Chubb, and Linus Yale. In the last 75 years, John Fall, Madeline in France, a John Falls in England, Addie Wendt in Germany, Lockmasters in Germany, the KGB, and Lisi Tools out of China. These are the main producers of bypass tools for high security locks. And you need to understand advancements in lock designs that drove attack techniques in lever tumbler, pin tumbler, telescoping pin, abloid disc, abloid disc, wafer tumbler, sidebars, and magnetics. All of these designs are explained in detail so that you can understand why they can be defeated. We have a lot of rules, um, important rules, primary rules that I developed over the last really 40 years. All security is about liability. Always believe you can defeat a lock. Look for simple solutions to solve what appears to be complex problems. Look, look for exploiting a design or combination of designs in simple or hybrid attacks. Identify the problem and probable solutions. Things are rarely what they appear to be. Hold on one second. Okay. More primary rules. R&D costs money and many companies take shortcuts, which means that there can be design defects and the ability to exploit designs. Any openings and locks create vulnerabilities. Look for the path of least resistance to unlock the lock. You don't know what you don't know. One of the biggest problems in the la is the lack of imagination <clears throat> by design engineers and red teams that test locks. Consider hybrid attacks, which are uh, explored in detail. 
Electrons don't open doors, mechanics do. What does that mean? Everybody now is focused on electronic locks with encryption software. Again, we, uh, we don't care about that. We attack the interface between hardware and software. So to us, credentials don't mean anything. Neither does encryption in locks. Each cylinder defeats bypass the credentials. Blocks are designed to be attacked. All exploits replicate, replicate what the key does. And the easiest way to open a lock is with a key, rather obvious. So programming access and audit capability can provide security vulnerabilities. I actually just came out with a new patent in the United States uh, regarding the bypass of audit trails in electronic cylinders and hopefully how to secure those locks so they can't be defeated. Clever does not mean secure. There's a lot of clever designs, but that doesn't mean they're secure. You cannot get around the laws of physics. You must examine both critical and non-critical components for a component failure analysis. Everything is suspect in locks. Movable parts, springs, motors, solenoids, ferrous materials, magnetic principles, inertia, coils, all of these can be circumvented. And so if you're a design team or a red team or doing a security analysis on the locks to protect your infrastructure, you need to look at every issue to see if it can be exploited. Okay, we're going to go through case examples. Um, we're going to talk about medical code setting keys, um, electronic locks defeat, shock vibration, magnetics, and laws of physics. We're going to talk about electromagnetic cylinders, Kaba, Kaba Simplex 1000 and 5300, access control systems, magnetic ring defeats, electronic safe and magnetic attack, and the attack on iLock out of Finland, which is a very good lock. And 15 years ago at DEF CON, we showed how to defeat that lock multiple ways. And I have to say, all of the locks in these examples, the manufacturers have corrected the problems. This is especially true with iLock and with Medico. Medico, by the way, is very prevalent in France. It's very popular. Okay, here we go. First, we're going to talk about an attack against worm gears. This slide shows a worm gear, and basically, in the lock, um, the, uh, when the credential, correct, correct credentials are applied, it drives a motor that moves the worm gear that moves the opening or closing access block. So, this lock is very popular in Europe in different designs. Um, we were tasked with analyzing it, and it involves Newton's first law of motion. Um, and so we were able to open this lock and defeat the audit trail within about 30, 30 seconds. seconds. We created a little jig that links to the uh, outside knob, and you'll, you'll see how my partner, Tobias Bluesmanis, um, spun it. The manufacturers all tested these locks against the capability of spinning them with a drill motor. That didn't work because Newton's Newton's law of motion in, with regard to worm gears, you had to accelerate and decelerate the worm gear in order to defeat it. Here we go. Hopefully you guys can hear me. I hope you can hear that. Yep. So what, what you're, you're seeing, seeing is the worm gear moving forward in order to open. So we're just spinning it back and forth.
And as you can see, the worm gear is now moving forward and the lock is open. And if we reverse that, we can lock the lock and the audit trail has been defeated. There is no audit trail of that lock being open. So it, it caused a lot of trouble with lock manufacturers. This is the next one. Hold on a second. This was a, a high security lock from China. Um, they had no idea about uh, Newton's laws of motion or how they affected their lock design. It was really defective. So we'll show it, show you what happened. Okay, this is the next one. This was one of our best exploits. This involved medical locks, and um, a test was done by Wired Magazine in the United States. They called us up to headquarters. They had six sealed locks that we had to open in under 10 minutes each, which, are, which is the high security standard for the United States. Then they had us bump open these locks. We developed four keys that would allow us to bump or pick all of their non-master keyed locks in the world. And so what we're going to show you here is about a four minute video. I hope, and Alex, let me know if you cannot hear this audio. Um, this was done at Wired Magazine headquarters. There also was a very large article written about us. And this caused a great deal of consternation in the lock industry in the United States. Oops, just a minute. Okay, so before we get to that, this is how Medico works. The Medico key rotates pin tumblers as well as lifting them. This key shows the different angles and how all of the pins align for the sidebar. This is a very clever lock. It's been around since 1970. So we developed four keys. We re received a lot of patents for them. So basically, Medico is based on rotation angles, three rotation angles, six pin tumblers. There are 729 codes of angles. We combined all those codes in four keys. So code setting keys, Medico high security locks. They were the top high security locks in America. They're sold throughout the world. It's a unique design. In 2007, they announced they were bump proof. We received four patents and wrote the book open in 30 seconds. And of course, the Wired Magazine article. So this is what the keys looked like. These four keys allowed us to pick and bump open their locks. And here's what happened at Wired headquarters. Mark Tobias here. We're going to be opening these cylinders. We're going to take them one by one without showing you. Yeah. Put them to the device.
Alors, comme il n'y a pas d'explication, de, il n'y a pas de son, je vais vous commenter un peu ce qui se passe. Concrètement, ces serrures, il y a deux choses à faire en même temps pour qu'on les ouvre. Il faut aligner les goupilles en hauteur comme une serrure classique. Donc là, c'est ce qu'on voit qui est fait avec les outils de crochetage classique. Mais ce qui a été fait juste avant, alors qu là qu'on ne voit pas, parce que c'est au tout, tout début de la vidéo, ou alors on ne le voit pas nécessairement, avec les quatre clés, une des quatre clés en l'occurrence, c'est de pouvoir tourner les goupilles sur elles-mêmes. Donc ça, c'est un mécanisme qui est très, très spécifique à cette marque. Ça rend leur crochetage extrêmement compliqué. Sauf que si on a les quatre clés, voilà, donc là, c'est une des clés, on voit, c'est la A, visiblement, ou la 4, je ne sais pas trop. Euh, ça permet de tourner les goupilles d'une façon et une fois que ce, cette rotation est faite, on peut la crocheter comme un cylindre classique. Donc en fait, on fait descendre énormément le niveau de sécurité. On passe d'une serrure qui prendrait... 20-30 minutes à crocheter pour un excellent crocheteur euh, à une serrure plutôt classique euh, du moment qu'on a utilisé l'une de ces quatre clés. Et il faut essayer les quatre clés parce qu'on ne peut pas savoir à l'avance laquelle de ces quatre clés va permettre d'obtenir la bonne rotation. Et juste petite explication supplémentaire pendant qu'il y a la vidéo. Euh, c'était affiché, je ne sais plus le nombre exact, mais je crois que c'était 729 codes différents qui ont été ramenés à 4, parce que les codes, chaque rotation, c'est soit 0, soit 20 degrés, soit moins 20 degrés. Mais euh, Marc Tobias s'est rendu compte que si on met 10 degrés, ça va fonctionner si c'est 0 ou plus 20. Si on met moins 10 degrés, ça va fonctionner si c'est 0 ou moins 20. Et du coup, euh, bah, de manière, je dirais, mathématique, on arrive à réduire le nombre de combinaisons et euh, en plus, les, tous les codes n'existent pas nécessairement dans la nature. Donc euh, ça a permis d'avoir réellement quatre clés qui en réalité couvrent plus que quatre codes, évidemment. Euh, C'est tout l'intérêt de la technique. Okay, so hold on a second. So that well, I hope you all could hear that. Hold on a minute. So that was actually the book that we ended up writing about what we did. The next lock that we attacked this I lock out of Finland. This is a really good lock. Um, it received several patents and presidential awards in Finland. Um, basically, this is an electronic lock, and it's a one-pin tumbler lock once the electronics release the locking mechanism. It was very, very clever. This is how it works. So we figured out how to open this lock in seconds with one key that would open all their locks in the world. They, with no need for credentials, virtually no security in the original designs. And the, the lock manufacturer did a great job in fixing it. We like iLock now. They're very secure, very clever electronic cylinders. Here's how we defeat it in one way. We trimmed the tip of the key by about 32 seconds of an inch, which they never thought of. Uh, which defeated the relock mechanism, as you can see with the red circle. We could do that with a key, or we could do that outside the lock with a small Dremel tool. Either way, we could set the lock so it could be opened by everybody until it was reset. So I lock, uh, it was a mechanical lock. We also exploited their timing. We figured out how to insert and remove the keys to defeat their, their timing. Okay, this is shock and vibration with the ACS. This is access control system out of uh, China. And so we're just wrapping that lock.
and it's open. This should not be possible on a high security padlock. We also put it on a fence uh, mounting outside to see what happens. Hello. I can't talk right now. Uh, just call me in half hour on, on, on <clears throat> video to Paris. So that lock, that lock is open. Watch, watch this. So this is to protect high security assets? No, not quite. Okay, next example. This is an Iseo electronic cylinder uh, out of, uh, I think, Italy that we uh, received for testing. And actually, I did this in my office, uh, not our usual video watch. And this defeats the audit trail on this lock. There's no battery in the key, which means the processor is not working in the lock. And I'm going to bump it open. Okay, so first of all, you can see the, the lock is working. That key cannot open the lock because there's no electronic credentials. So this is called bumping. And a lot of locks were subject to this problem. And that lock is open. Okay. And that bump hammer was developed specifically uh, in the Netherlands. Let's go to the next one. This is really a, a stupid design problem. Uh, this is an electronic cylinder <clears throat> with an RFID key. And there's a data port that you can see at the bottom of the lock. So we insert a wire. They never thought of this through a data port to get to the mechanism that allows us to open this lock. This is used in thousands and thousands of facilities. <clears throat> it's a really clever lock, but it was really a defective design. Watch this. So we're feeding the wire. We took a bar to retract the deadbolt once we got to the, the critical point. So, We'll show this is exactly what we did. We fished a wire up the data port. That's the that's the mechanism that controls this entirely. So when the wire comes in, The lock is unlocked. Okay. Next slide. This was a knockoff lock in Canada. Uh, very unsuccessful. You can see what happened. And again, really insecurity engineering. This is how the lock works. This is a little pro, completely defeats their security. It's a screwdriver. OK, 
Okay. This was the Medico uh, deadbolt, the most popular in America. We figured out how to shear the screws that control or lock in the tailpiece. This was a really simple defeat. It caused a lot of problems with lock manufacturers. So we just sheared the, the entire security of this high security deadbolt was two little screws, 83 thousandths uh, diameter. We, we made a screwdriver, went through, and were able to unlock the lock. Not good. Okay, and lock it again. This was this was the back of the lock to show you those two screws that were sheared, the two holes. This was an electronic cylinder that we figured out how to defeat by feeding a wire through uh, a feed through hole on the printed circuit board to get to the um, pin that control the lock. You see it on the top. Now you see it unlock. We were able to access that and defeat a very high security lock. That problem has been fixed. But again, it shows insecurity engineering. This was the use of a magnetic ring to defeat, oops, didn't want to do that, to defeat a high security lock. You can see that magnetic ring, okay. No electronics in the key, which means also no audit trail. This was a special ring developed in Germany. It's got four magnets in it. You spin it around some of the locks. And the lock can be opened and locked with the key with no electronic credentials, really a problem. Okay. This was a kryptonite bike lock, really insecure engineering. We, I figured out how to open this lock in 2003 with a ballpoint pen to impression it. Uh, it, it resulted in about $10 million in loss, 350,000 locks had to be recalled by the manufacturer. This was a safe that demonstrated insecure. You could insert a wire and go to the reset mechanism and open the safe. This was a high security lock that's used for government facilities. Unfortunately, they forgot there's a bypass system um, for control points to open locks remotely. We figured out how to go through their little grommet and short out the circuit board and do the same thing with that pick that you see. Okay, we can get to the next slide. Okay, this is the best. Uh, we're coming to the end here. This is a very popular access control lock and uh, really around the world. It was made by Kaba. Uh, we figured out how to defeat it with a magnet. The correct code opens the lock. Unfortunately, a rare earth magnet also opens the lock. This is a three inch magnet. All of these locks had to be updated. Okay. And we'll go through that. This was another medical lock that we figured out how to defeat with a paper clip. This lock, um, we looked at the design engineers were all software guys. They had no clue um, how to design a lock. So they used nitinol wire to change this when the temperature is increased on the wire, a current is run through the wire. So they thought this would be a great idea to, for a lock design. Unfortunately, it wasn't. And we were able to open this with a little handheld torch 
or a hair dryer with hot air. So basically, all of these examples show a lack of imagination in engineering, lack of probably lack of proper testing, failure to understand hybrid attacks, improper reliance on standards, manufacturers do not understand bypass techniques, and an appearance of security. So all of this is covered in the two books. Here's my contact information and I would welcome comments. Uh, please contact me if you have any questions. Um, I'm, I'm readily available. Thank you very much.